He minimizes his role, advances in us his role in the proclamation of the decision to kill. No one bothered us, we were too insignificant. He said he sat in the corner with the stenographer, and not once did he voice either objection or surprise while he argued again and again he was only following order. orders. He gives himself far too little credit for innovation. When asked he felt about the denial of Jewish citizens, he answered, I didn't give these details, these details are thought. He does object to Crystal Nacht, the Nazi program of November 1911, in which hundreds of synagogues throughout the Reich were burned, 7,000 stores were, stores were looted, 30,000 men from 16 to 60 were arrested and detained. Senseless destruction, he called, not the work of the police or the SD. He depicted himself as a loyal bureaucrat, honorable and faithful to the oath he had taken. When asked, were you loyal to the SS, he answered, I had taken an oath. In the first few years, there were no inner conflicts of any kind. I sat at my desk, I did my work. I was undisturbed by the task at hand, interested in bread and work, not in the Jewish question. Himmler once remonstrated the German people for having a favorite Jew, a good Jew who should be saved. Bachman is apologetic about one thing. He's apologetic about the Jew he helped escape as a favor to his uncle, who reminded him of the previous assistance he had given him obtaining a job. As a loyal SS man, I should not have done it. His values are clear. Orders are orders. You've got to obey. That's that. He recalled apologetically the time that anger had gotten the best of him and he had lost control, which seldom happened. I left myself go and I slapped him in the face. He had slapped Dr. Lohenhurst, a Jewish communal official in Vienna. I did not tolerate physical violence, that's why I apologized in uniform and the presence of my staff. As to his responsibility, he denies he behaved illegally, he was a truth teller even to his subjects or so he reports. I didn't lie, I'm not the kind of man who can tell a lie. Thus he told Jewish officials where the shipments were going, but only if they asked. He was not responsible for the order. It was none of my doing. They were deported or arrested, he said. When asked about his function within the extermination unit, he demurred. I was responsible only for evacuation. I never claimed not to know about liquidation, which is the murder of the Jews. I only said that Bureau 4 before had nothing to do with it. I couldn't help myself because I had orders, I had nothing to do with this business. When pressed on the killing, he retorts to psychologically comfortable explanation, I couldn't help myself because I had orders, but I had nothing to do with this business. Again, he proclaims the limits of his responsibility. I had nothing to do with killing Jews, I never killed a Jew, a Jew. I never ordered someone to kill a Jew. I've never done such a thing, that's what gives me inner tranquility. I'm guilty because I helped with the evacuation. I'm guilty of complicity, but not of murder. He displays some compassion for his own psyche, not drawing too close to the killing process. He expressed horror at what the Nazis were doing. I saw gas in installation and I was horrified. He was somewhat apologetic for his personal lack of inner strength. My nerves weren't quite strong enough I couldn't listen to such things without their affecting me. I didn't look inside, I couldn't stand the screaming, and I was shaken. But he took steps to keep himself away from the killing, not to remove himself from responsibility for deportation. My job, he said, is to obey and to comply. When asked, one could say no evacuation, no gas chamber, and Eichmann answered, yes, you could put it that way, though I had nothing to do with that sector. He then protested that not all the people I evacuated were killed. I had no knowledge whatever of who was killed or who was not. He protests his innocence of murder from a juridical standpoint. I am guilty of complicity. He stresses the point again, I had nothing to do with the things I can tell you truthfully, and no one will prove to the contrary. This very same mantra continues throughout many months of interrogation. Let's listen to them as a struggle for inner self-justification. I had my orders, I didn't kill them, I didn't hang them. My latest responsibility ceased 
when the military police took over the shipments of the evacuation stations. Tom Laird, a folk song comedian, once sang out, we send up the rockets but where they come down, that's my, not my department, said Werner von Braun. So too, clearly, Adolf Eichmann. His description of slave labor is both interesting and accurate. It reveals the Nazi mentality. Slave labor was a means to death of many, what I can term natural diminution. When asked what he meant by the term he quickly, quickly answered, perfectly normal dying. It was those who survived work that possessed the greatest death, uh, uh, the greatest problem. They were to be killed, or as I have put it, they must be treated accordingly since this natural elite, if released, must be viewed as potentially the germ cell of a new Jewish order. He was a self-described honorable man. He said the loyalty oath itself calls for unquestionable obedience, so naturally we had to comply with these laws and regulations. The laws were legally maintained. The final solution itself was a Führer's order, the so-called Führer's order. The Führer's order had the force of law. The Führer's order had the force of law. It had to obey. And he said, this is what I would have done. If they had said to me, your father is a traitor, if they told me your father is a traitor, I had to kill him, I'd have done that. At that time, I obeyed my orders without thinking. It made no difference what the orders were. I had no more responsibility whatsoever because the oath I, oath I had to take obligated me to loyalty and obedience. The oath came from a hierarchical superior. Someone else was responsible. Let me conclude by saying something very incredible which is that he gives a Kantian justification for his entire thing. He said, look, Manuel Kant said that ethical men must act on a basis that can be universalizable. If I commit my word, that I must always obey my word because that's an ethical principle. Maybe I shouldn't have given my word I was only the receiver of orders, never the initiator. On principle, I never went to look at anything unless I expressed the order to. I ran a clean shop. I trained my subordinates to be punctilious. Nothing could be undertaken unless it could be somewhat justified in black and white. He was willing to carry out orders regardless of the nature of the order. His reasoning was quite simple. During the war, in any case, that's all there was to do with that. I'm not going to have time to do the third, so let me just touch for a moment on Mengele because it touches with the science that we're about to, we've been working on all week. A word about how you look at some historical material. When I was working on Joseph Mengele, one thing intrigued me and shook me beyond belief. Mengele, you know, was the man who conducted experiments on children at Auschwitz. Now, the most interesting thing is what happened on January 18, 1945, and what happened in 1947. When Auschwitz was being evacuated, Joseph Mengele took the results of his experiments with him. He thought so detached was he from the outside world, he thought that they would be a key to fame and prominence and scientific advancement in the world beyond Auschwitz. Now what makes taking this material with you so extraordinary is this material is clearly incriminatory. If he is captured, this material reveals everything that he has done, and all the person has to do in order to prove his guilt is to present the material he what? He has in his possession. Now, to the very end, let me read a couple of things on, on this portrait, but let me tell you one other detail which startled me. 1947, Joseph Mengele is leaving for Argentina. It's 
living under a false passport and a false name. But what does he take with him? He takes with him the very same experimentation. Now, let's understand this because trying to interpret it begins to struggle. A man who's forced to flee his country because he is wanted. A man who understands that if he is captured by the Allies, in all likelihood he will be hung. A man who is forced, forced to abandon his country and even his name cannot do what? Cannot abandon the scientific material, the quotation marks scientific material that he brought with him. The point being that he thought of himself, he thought of the experiments as a key to prominence in the outside world. He kept the data in him, even in hiding, even at a time when these revelations would have doomed him to trial and near certain punishment by death. To the very end, he thought of himself as a scientist whose studies in eugenics was legitimate science appropriate to the medical profession. And he continued to believe in German racial superiorities and the rules of his science. His dream was grand improvement of the human species, the dominance of the master race, masterfully improved by what he called applied biology. <clears throat> Nazism attracted such men, it cultivated and promoted such science. It gave them the opportunity to practice such medicine uninhibited by the normal constraints of accepted medical science. Let me conclude then with a very basic element. When we look at the Holocaust, we have to understand something that the key to understanding it is to understand it not as a resort to medievalism, but as an expression of the dark side of modernization, an expression of the fascination with the unlimited power that the empowered modern person enjoys. Unlimited power unconstrained by basic values. Unlimited power facilitated by a government that is fascinated with the expression of unlimited power. All of this becomes essential for understanding the perpetration of a deed that has become for our world the negative absolute, the ultimate manifestation of evil and rightfully so, because the more you look into this evil, the more you see its modernity and the more you see its totality. Thank you very much. Truths. They are fragile truths. The equality of human beings is the one thing that when you look around the world you do not see. If you look around the world, what do you see? You see the inequality among human beings. So when I uh, recite those words um, in, that are the core of the American experience, and indeed the core of our religious experience, uh, I recite them as a prayer, not as a self-evident truth, as something we have to make true. Uh, three. Uh, three quick questions for uh, presumably fairly short answers, and then I've got some complicated questions following. You mentioned the movie Life is Beautiful. Was it good or bad for Holocaust remembrance? Well, the answer to that is very peculiar. Of all the lessons you learn from, you, you, of all the lessons you learn from the Holocaust, life is beautiful is not one of them. Uh, and the real, uh, I, I must confess the following, that I had a reaction to Bernini before he got the Oscar and after he got the Oscar. Before he got the Oscar, I thought he was an absolutely brilliant actor, and after he got the, got the Oscar, Oscar, 
Uh, his actions there convinced me that he wasn't acting, he was really being himself. And that is that Bernini went to the edge, and, and, and we see this in the producers as well. One of the great temptations in dealing with this is to go to farce and humor. And farce and humor have to be understood as a means for overcoming what is really the reality, which is despair and, um, despair and, and darkness. And, and all of that depression that sets in with it. We have to always be careful, and I have one series of, of um, I have a book that will be the only book that I've published posthumously, because I can't get away with it, I'm not sure I can do it very well. The book is called Humor in the Holocaust, and the reason for that is that um, many years ago I was reading um, Abraham Kaplan's diary and found myself laughing. And I said, what an atrocious human being are you reading this material and laughing at the same time? And I said, I'm not the worst human being in the history of the world. So if I'm laughing, it must be that there's humor in the material. And therefore, I began collecting in a file, sort of throwing in whenever I came across humor. And somebody always has to look at how humor is handled by the oppressed and where the comedians come from in every culture. Life is beautiful, uh, is, that's not a simple answer, but it's a complicated question. He attempted to use humor to get at this. He almost completely succeeded, though the more you know about the Holocaust, the less credible the film was. One word of humor. Um, the longer I live, the more genius I respond to a kid's response. And I challenge you this about as intelligent an audience as any uh, speaker can ask for. Kid the more Sagenos asks the question, what would you like most of all if you would have this son? It comes up with absolutely the perfect answer, and I will give uh, a gift of all my works to anybody who comes up with a better answer. He says, I'd like to be orphaned. <laughs> Question, you mentioned that the medical doctors signed the death certificates of the victims. What did they list as the cause of death? Uh, asphyxiation, uh, natural causes, etc. In fact, it's the medical certain. Let me explain this for 30 seconds. The interesting thing is that whenever we look at Nazi medicine, we look most especially at the behavior of Nazis in concentration camps. The more interesting look at Nazi medicine is not the behavior of Nazis in concentration camps, but the behavior of the T4 operation. And what differed between the concentration camps and the T4 operation was that the people in the T4 operation who were killed had a constituency at home. You don't love a uh, physically handicapped or mentally handicapped, mentally challenged child less you love them more. And who are your peers? Your peers are other parents who have kids who are institutionalized with your kids. So when one got a death certificate and the other got a death certificate at the same time, or roughly the same time, the first thing they did was to call other parents with the kids there. And that's how the process was uncovered. That led to speeches of, 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 of Bishop von Gallen and others uh, opposing this, and it drove it underground. It just shows you what might have happened if public opinion had opposed the murder uh, of the Jews. So the doctors who behaved in this did everything. A medical board made the decision who was classified, who was not classified, the document reads, take, um, um, I'm going to read you one, one sentence document because I think it's, it, it gives you the whole thing. This is a document under which 200,000 people are ultimately killed. I want you to listen to it because I want you to listen to how easily we can hear it and applaud it. Reich leader Philip Euler and Dr. Brandt are charged with responsibility for expanding the authority of physicians to be designated by name to the end that patients considered incurable according to the best available human judgment of their state of health can be granted a mercy killing. That doesn't sound like an ominous document. That doesn't sound like the type of thing upon which 200,000 human beings are put to death. But it was. Expanding the authority of physicians designated by name 
after the best available human judgment of state of health can be granted mercy killing. Uh, my wife, who is in the audience who worked for the United States Senate, said one of the reasons why you want government involved in this goes to stem cell research. And I hope I'm quoting you correctly, otherwise I know I will be, uh, I will be corrected. One of the reasons you want government involved in the funding of stem cell research, despite the controversies about it, is because government can set parameters and government can establish legal constraints which do not depend upon the medical profession or the scientific world to do that itself. You spoke of Hitler's anti-Semitism as a foundation for the Holocaust but what of the anti-Semitism as an integral part of church teaching as a foundation for Hitler? The answer to that is yes. The answer to that also is that one of the great things that has happened, uh, let me give it to you in the, in the most visual way imaginable. Teach you the theology of Emil Fackenheim in 30 seconds. <laughs> Fackenheim believes the Holocaust was a great rupture. And in the aftermath of rupture, what do you do? The rupture was great, it was almost total, but it was not complete. Because for, if philosophy was represented by Martin Heidegger, then there was a mediocre philosophy who taught his students that they had to be ethically responsible, they were the leaders of the white rose. If religion was terrible and contributing to anti-Semitism, we have Les Chamon, which saved 5,000 Jewish youngsters, and the preacher preached, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Go out and practice it. That was the end of every one of the sermons. What's the greatness of what we've experienced in the United States and indeed the world, which is the mending of the basis of hatred of religious anti-Semitism? That is one of the great things that emblematic or symbolized by the Pope's trip to Jerusalem last year, in which he apologized in the name of Christianity for Christian anti-Semitism. He said something very basic that would have shaken the world in 1942-43. He said that, Christian, that, that anti-Semitism is anti-Christian. And the Roman Catholic Church and other churches have changed three things. They've changed the teaching of contempt. You have borne witness here to the notion of also changing the teaching of supersessionism. What do we regard when we go back to the, Abraham, to the Abrahamic tradition? We look at what's common, not what sets us apart. We look about where we can share, not where we can divide. And the third thing that the Pope did was to, uh, uh, Pope John XXIII in Nostra Aetate in the Vatican Council, is to change the understanding of Scripture so that Jews are not responsible for crucifixion with the idea that if Jews have killed God, then apt punishment for deicide is genocide. So when I look at the responsibility of the churches, it's one of the great areas, one of the very few areas in which I can report significant progress in the second half of the 20th century. And again, the Fackenheim thing, what's the strongest part of the garment that has been mended? The strongest garment is precisely where the mending has taken place. What's the strongest part of Christianity? The strongest part of Christianity is where it has come to confront and transform its teachings of Jews. And let's look at the opposite. You just had an example in Syria last, uh, about two months ago, in which uh, by, uh, um, uh, the young uh, successor of, of uh, Assad um, in, in Syria uh, want to enlist the Pope in alliance against Judaism as the murderers of, of Jesus and the crucifiers of the Christ, not understanding all that had taken place in the last 55 years to transform Christianity. And therefore, these traditions have to be changed, they have to be, they have to be revoked. Let me tell you one great story in, in 37. 1984, I'm giving, 85, I'm giving a lecture in my course in Georgetown on anti-Semitism. And the young lady raises her hand and says, Professor Bernard, what did Jesus Christ kill me? So I look at her, blonde haired, blue eyed, beautiful young woman. I said, do me one favor. Tell me a little bit about your historical, your background. 
tells me about her background, 15 years of Roman Catholic parochial education, she's never heard of Jesus Christ. So I do a quick thing, I've never done a class, so how many of you folks are, are Catholics in this class? They raise their hands, how many of you have heard of Jesus Christ killers? There are 65 Catholics in the class, none have ever heard of Jesus Christ killers. Ten Jews in the class, guess how many of them have heard about Jesus Christ? All ten. 